This episode of Kobe Explains is brought to you by Brilliant. The aviation industry can be brutally unforgiving. No matter how exceptional the business model or how well it's executed, airlines frequently collapse due to factors outside of their control. A few years back, I did a deep dive into why Norwegian is the poster child for this phenomenon, and why it is the unluckiest airline of all time. But the thing is, this misfortune can extend beyond airlines. Airplane manufacturers can also pull all the right levers and still fall victim to this fickle industry. And there may be no aircraft family that suffered worse timing or misfortune than the Airbus A340. Let me explain. Real quick folks, YouTube is still telling me less than 20% of the people watching this video are actually subscribed to the channel. So go ahead and hit that button and bell so we can build the absolute best community in aviation together. Now to understand the A340's misfortune, we need to go all the way back to the late 70s. At the time, Airbus was riding high. Its debut aircraft, the A300, was a smash hit, becoming the world's first wide-bodied twin. Of course, this success didn't come cheap. Airbus spent nearly $10 billion on its development. So to build on the plane's success and increase the return on investment, Airbus turned to its American counterpart for inspiration on what to do next. The 707 had done for Boeing what the A300 did for Airbus, propelling the company to the forefront of commercial aviation. And Boeing cleverly capitalized on its success by carrying its DNA across future aircraft. The 727, 737, and 757 all share its basic fuselage design, and they all look remarkably similar. This helped Boeing lower program and production costs while maintaining commonality across its narrowbody fleet. Airbus hoped to do the same with the A300, using it as a template to develop a whole lineup of widebodies. And there was one key market segment that they were keen to disrupt. The DC-10 had long dominated the 300 to 350 seat segment, but by the early 80s, the plane looked vulnerable. Not only had it suffered a string of crashes that hurt its reputation, but it was also getting old. DC-10 operators would soon be seeking its replacement, and with no other competitors on the horizon, Airbus saw a golden opportunity to supplant the Trijet. Now, the decision to build a DC-10 competitor was easy enough. What wasn't so easy was settling on how many engines it should have. Should Airbus stick with the A300's two-engine setup or add more? The idea of building a new trijet was quickly dismissed due to design limitations, but Boeing executives were drawn to the idea of building a quadjet. Now, by today's standards, this might sound like an insane decision. It's a well-known fact that quadjets are much more expensive to operate than twins. But in the early 80s, the benefits of twin jets were largely offset by regulation. Early turbofans weren't very reliable, so airlines weren't permitted to fly their twins more than 60 minutes away from a diversion airport. This decreased the likelihood of an off-field ditching during an engine failure, but it also prevented planes like the A300 from flying over large bodies of water. This created a bit of a conundrum for Airbus, but at the end of the day, the DC-10 made its money as a long-haul transoceanic workhorse, so no twin could serve as its replacement. Ultimately, the jetmaker took the conservative approach, and in 1982 began to design the Quadjet A340. This was a very sound decision. Yes, the plane would burn more fuel, but it seemed that the FAA would never waver on its stance towards twins. This was punctuated by a famous statement made by FAA Director Lynn Helms, who at the time said, It'll be a cold day in hell before I let twins fly long haul over water routes. And that's why Airbus executives were totally blindsided by what would come next. In 1985, the FAA changed its tune. Airlines successfully lobbied the agency into instituting ETOPS, easing the 60-minute diversion criteria for twins. At first, Airbus didn't see ETOPS as an existential threat. For one, early ETOPS regulations simply extended the diversion rule from 60 minutes to 120. While this opened up many transatlantic routes to twins, most transpacific routes remained off-limits. 
Even if European carriers scaled back their A340 fleets, key Asian customers like Cathay Pacific and Singapore Airlines still had a clear need. A second reason ETOPS wasn't really seen as a threat came from just how difficult it was to obtain. Each airline had to apply for ETOPS individually, and they often had to spend a lot of money to do so. For instance, TWA, who was the first airline to earn an ETOPS rating, spent $7 million per aircraft to retrofit them with the tech needed to achieve compliance. That was on top of the millions more they spent beefing up maintenance practices, which was another ETOPS requirement. Given these obstacles, the A340 seemed safe, and its development continued. But unfortunately for Airbus, it soon became clear that the benefits of ETOPS far outweighed its cost. After TWA received approval, it deployed a 767 on its daily flight between Boston and Paris, a flight originally served by a trijet. And the difference it made was staggering. The airline was saving upwards of 50,000 pounds of fuel per flight. All of a sudden, every transatlantic airline was clamoring for ETOPS. Still, Airbus had the Asian market secured, right? Well, not quite. ETOPS proved an immediate success, both from a financial and safety perspective. So just three years later, the FAA introduced ETOPS 180. Now, twins could fly up to 180 minutes from an airport. This completely changed the calculus, since 95% of global routes were now technically serviceable by twins. But by this point, it was too late for Airbus to change course. The A340 had started taking orders and was already well into production. Airbus went from having a strong competitive advantage in the 300-seat space to having none at all, all before a single A340 could take flight. To make matters worse, Airbus's biggest rival was paying close attention. While the A340 was an extremely modern and capable aircraft, even by today's standards, Boeing recognized its fuel burn disadvantage, and it responded by developing the 777. This massive twin jet would compete with the A340 head on, and has since gone on to crush it in sales. While the A340 secured 375 orders during its run of production, the 777 has racked up over 2,000 and counting. Despite this misfortune, the story of the A340 does have a silver lining. During the plane's initial evaluation, there were a few vocal customers who didn't like the direction Airbus was headed. They much preferred Airbus build a twin with a capacity between the A300s and A340s. Now, Airbus wasn't going to give up the A340 for this vocal minority, but they did realize that co-developing such a plane alongside the A340 could be done for fairly cheap. It was originally thought that this second plane, later known as the A330, would trail the A340 in sales, but that couldn't have been further from the truth. Airbus has gone on to sell almost five times as many A330s as A340s, making it the company's most successful widebody. The A330's success certainly helps make up for the A340's misfire, but we need to call the A340 what it is, a failure. But it was a failure by no fault of Airbus, they did everything right here. One, they correctly identified a market segment that was ripe for disruption, and two, they moved quickly to secure a first mover advantage. What's more, they ended up building a remarkably advanced and capable airplane. At the end of the day, it would have been foolish for them not to act when they did and in the way they did. And that's exactly what makes the A340 the unluckiest jet of all time. Now, I've personally never flown the A340, which is a bummer because time is running out for the plane. If you've ever flown one, let me know about your experience in the comments. I'm eager to hear what it's like. And thanks again to Brilliant for sponsoring today's video. I was pumped when Brilliant reached out to me because it is the platform for lifelong learners. Their interactive courses in areas like comp sci, science, and math not only make learning more fun, but actually helps you retain way more info than if you just watched a lecture. What's more, Brilliant lets you learn at your own pace, with bite-sized lessons to fit into your busy schedule. Now, I personally was an econ major in college, so I took a number of high-level statistics and math classes, which Brilliant is now helping me to brush up on. But I know a lot less about the traditional sciences, and as a huge avgeek, I'd really like to know more about how planes actually work.
That's why I've been checking out Brilliant's course on the physics of everyday objects, which helps explain things like how planes fly. If you want to do the same, then you're in luck. Brilliant is accessible to all knowledge levels, and you can start today for free. Visit brilliant.org slash Kobe explains to do so, and the first 200 of you who sign up will get 20% off a premium subscription. So go to the link in the description to check it out. Thank you so much to my patrons for helping to make this video possible. If you like my work and want to help the channel grow, go ahead and check out this link right here. And as always, if you learned something new today, leave a like and subscribe to keep learning. And until I see you again, don't forget to look up.